I love talking with passionate business owners. Their enthusiasm is irresistible. Their knowledge is invaluable. And their wisdom holds the keys to transforming your passion into a successful business. As a marketing strategist, I help people around the world innovate and grow their business. I'm Jay Hamilton Roth, and this is Business with Passion. Today's episode features guests who make a living doing things that seem like child's play. Kirk Rademacher, stressed as a construction manager and recovering from a divorce, discovered his business almost by accident, relaxing at the beach and building sandcastles. He now travels around the world and builds fantastic sand sculptures everywhere. I was lucky enough to be in a situation where I was working not, not far from here as a, as a project manager, stressed out, uh, you know, and when the phone would ring, uh, when you're a project manager at a construction company, it's not somebody who's saying good job, you know, it's somebody who's angry. Uh, so I would go to the beach at Stinson, you know, to just sort of chill and try to just get rid of all the stress from the week. And I think that's what I realized when I started doing the sand that I was really, I was being seduced by it. And I really can't say it was my passion, but I felt this sort of intoxication that it was going to take me somewhere. And so I, I guess I really can't nail down the exact passion. All I know is that this, this pile of sand is taking me places that I could never have gone when I was a project manager. I went to San Jose State and uh, with a degree in art and painting, but really uh, I had sort of an engineering minor going on that I never really completed, and I love drafting and design. I love drawing. And when I'm doing the sculpture here, uh, it's like I'm doodling in three dimensions. Uh, by just, I'm not trying to create any any particular thing, but I see, I see my high school orthographic projections and perspective drawings when I, you know, when I do these. Except that I'm not confined by uh, a straight edge or, you know, or any sort of metric units or anything. It's just, it's just my eye. I love the fact that I don't have a level or a tape measure anymore. It's just my eye, and I just use that. It was sort of a, gr a gradual thing. Uh, I realized that I had this talent and there were sand sculpture events out there. Uh, I submitted pictures to, of my best work to uh, South Padre Island's event down in Texas and they let me in. And it was the heavies on the beach, uh, the heavyweights of sand sculpture there and I was, I was so nervous and I just, I just didn't want to get blown off the beach by these people. And I wasn't. And I did a piece that was, it was, you know, it didn't really raise any eyebrows, but it, it hung in there. And that, and then through those people and learning, you know, how they were making a living, and everybody has sort of a different, all sand sculptors had sort of a different way that they were doing it. Some people do shopping malls, some people do the corporate team building. Uh, one of the fabulous things about this, this line of work is when the phone rings, you have no idea what it's going to be. It could be crazy stuff. Uh, like the Sandblasters TV show where they call up, oh yes, we want you to come and participate in this TV show where we blow up the sandcastles. Uh, there's a woman in New York that called me up. She says, Kirk, I, you're not going to believe what I want you to do. I want you to carve hummus. I go, sure. I flew to New York. You know, this big trade show. Uh, I've, done, I've done little kids' birthday parties for, you know, just for, for a small budget. I worked for inner city kids for nothing. Uh, I did a party for Dustin Hoffman down in Malibu. Uh, it, I, I, I've done photo shoots for TV commercials. I don't know, I just, you never know, you know, what, uh, what's, 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 coming, what's coming up. My business partner, Rusty, is a, is a very strong carver doing uh, organic things. And so he does all the figurative work, whether it's a person or an animal. And I'm the architect, and I, I love doing architecture and machines. So we have a perfect 
uh, combination artistically uh, with the two of us now, we've done some high profile jobs. It's easier for, for the both of us working and we've had some pretty big clients. We just got back from France, uh, working for Yahoo, with Facebook, worked for Google. This is all in the past month. Uh, we're, we're going after it. Uh, it's hard, you know, you're always leaning over. Uh, Rusty and I were just talking, uh, we need to get these little stools for us to sit on. The buckets don't really get it. But I don't know, you always have to sort of contort yourself. Like I'm working up over there, and I, you know, you walk into the sculpture and you don't want to hit the arches over, and you see a detail you want to do, and you have to sort of reach around and, and kind of contort yourself to make, it, to make the detail. Uh, but you don't, you don't think about how hard it is um, uh, just like uh, what I keep saying, uh, that Bobby Caldwell song, what you won't do, you do for love, you know, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll hurt myself for this. I'm part of an international family of sand, ice, and snow carvers. I haven't carved much ice and snow, but we all know each other and sort of include each other in, diff in different projects. So. The few projects that are out there, uh, I get considered for, and it's really nice to, to be on that list. Um, there's a lot of carvers in Europe, and there's big projects over there every spring. I used to go over to Portugal or Turkey or something to, to take part in those. And you know, you don't make a lot of money. You make, they pay your way over there, they give you 140 euros a day, they put you up and they feed you and you're there with 60 other artists from around the world. Uh, everybody, I mean, it's a happy group. Uh, it's not your, your, your group at the office that, you know, I hate my job. It's a bunch of happy people. Uh, it's the absence of thought that, uh, that's, that's, that's the zone I'm trying to get into. Because when I'm not thinking, I'm, I'm channeling something else, you know, uh, that the piece isn't contrived. I'm just looking at lines, seeing where they're going, uh, and that's the only important thing is having some sort of rhythm and motion to the thing that I'm making. Uh, that's, that's all. That's all. Here at the American Steel Warehouse where uh, there's this whole art community here, and I'm not forced into any sort of commercial, uh, I don't have to make sketches and get it approved by some art director. Um, I can make my statement. I can just cut loose, because that's, that's what everybody does here. Uh, I mean, if you did it, if I came here and did a, a logo and a commercial piece, you know, it just, it just would not fly, and it wouldn't fly in my book either. Uh, I love making art uh, more than making money. Now, to me, when I when I make imagery here, with the, um, what I try to do is when I have two planes coming together to show movement, um, I will try to uh, put a shadow line between one plane and the other, so it, so it looks like there's two different elements, like one moves against the other. Um, I, li I love doing machines because they machines move. I can, just, I can just show them movement so many different ways uh, when, I just, when I just do mechanical parts. This project is uh, it's about a week old. Uh, it's, it's 24 tons of sand. A uh, truck backed in here, dumped it. I wet it down with a hose. And I compacted uh, a big block here. I compacted that. I, I basically, you know, I put it in a. I put this in a wooden box, and I had a tamper and water. And I just worked it hard and shoveled it in there a little bit at a time and compacted it. And I actually had a big piece in the center there, carved on it for two days, and it fell. And I was, oh, you know. Um, it turned out it wasn't such a bad thing. I rebounded with with that piece over there which I like better, but it's sort of off-center. 
and I had a lump of sand in the middle there. I go, what am I going to do with that? And I had all these arches here, and I go, oh, I'll put a big ball there. So, <laughs> and I'll make a little track for it. So, I mean, it, it's just, this is not something that I planned ahead. It, it, you, I, you just see it. It's sort of like looking at trees or clouds, and you look at them and you start seeing shapes and images, and it's the same thing with my stuff. I look at it and I just, I start seeing different things, and I'll just go with that. So, this other area all around is just, it's just the loose sand. It's, it, you can just push it up and carve it. All these, these sort of swirly things on the side, I just, you, can just, you can just shape it with your hands. Uh, I learned that from kids. I, I've done a lot of working, I've worked with elementary school kids and teenagers, but I, I noticed the little kids, you know, I give them tools, they don't want tools, they use their hands. And I thought, you know, to, to really, I mean, here they are, little kids, are, they're discovering and they're playing and they're using their hands. That's, that's the ultimate tool. So now, I mean, I have all these nice tools to work with, but I love just, I love using my hands. You know, you push it to the edge of what you can and can't do. I mean, I would like to feel like there's, there's, there's a lot more, that I'm going to discover a lot more imagery down the road and ways to push it. So, yeah, there's, there's tons of stuff I can't do. And I, I, want, to, I want to find out what they are. <laughs> this sand here is from the Quail Hollow Quarry in Santa Cruz. I looked for a long time to find really good sand here in the Bay Area. You're used to, a sand sculptor will use uh, an unwashed sand. We can't, you can't use playground sand. It's all the, the good stuff that we like is washed out. And if I go to um, uh, some city that I have to do a sand sculpture in, I'll find the quarry, I'll, I'll look at, uh, at their, where they wash the sand, and what is washed out is, I, I want that stuff there, the cheap stuff. They, well, don't you want this stuff that's really expensive and really good? No. I want that stuff. That's all that fine stuff that you took out because it has the silt and the clay in it. Probably the, the question I get asked the most is, doesn't it bother you that you're making this and, and then it's gone? And you know what, I, I have to go back to the, my, up to until I was 47 years old, I did everything I could to try to uh, build something that was permanent with my life. And then when everything, everything went, uh, and then I embraced that which was impermanent, the world opened up to me. And I don't think people understand the, the, how, how great it is working. It frees you. Uh, like, if I don't have to think about how am I going to get rid of this thing. I, I don't have to think about putting it somewhere in my garage. It's just there. It looks great. I meet all these great people then I walk away. I'm not trying to represent anything in particular. To me, art is uh, its just visual, visual candy. You look at it. It doesn't, there's not, doesn't have to be a story. It just has to look good. And that's all I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to tell a story. I just want this thing, when people see it, I want their eyes to pop out. I don't want them to think about, oh, what? What's the meaning behind it? You know, uh, that, that, that's, that shouldn't enter into it. It's just, if they say, wow, that looks cool. Or, or the, my, my favorite one is, dude, that's sick. That's what I like. For me, the keys to Kirk Rademacher's success are, first, he went back to his artistic roots to find inspiration for unique business niche. And next, by connecting with a worldwide group of sand sculptors, it's allowed him to be inspired by his community. Lastly, he balances his own creativity with clients who want to use his sculptures for their own public relations. My next guest, John Collins, created a business folding and flying paper airplanes. Not content simply demonstrating and teaching, he's also trying to break two world records. We're at the Maker Fair, and you're looking at the world-famous air, paper airplane guy, John Collins, a man who creates hand-folded uh, hand airplanes of a sort that the Air Force would love to own. <laughs> John Collins, the paper airplane guy, joining us, coming up on Cron4 News Weekend. Most people want to know, you know how I got into it. The answer really is I never got out of it. 
I started when I was about 10, and so that means I've been doing it for 40 years. <laughs> um, so uh, originally I didn't know much about origami, and then started um, studying origami, and the planes just got better and better and better. And then once the planes were getting better, I started getting interested in how the planes were flying, and then started reading a little more about flight dynamics, flight physics. So it was sort of a melding of three things, just a love of flight, a love of paper folding, and a love of physics, you know, about that. So. Um, it, it's just interesting to know why a plane might be able to do that. When you're teaching yourself, um, you have to get, it's like any art form, you've got to get past the artifice. You've know, got to learn some technique, get past the artifice, start thinking about how to you know, just get the paper to do what you want. And then um, flying machines, a little experience, a lot of experience in my case, throwing stuff and seeing what happens. So you have a notion uh, when you get finished with a plane, does it look like it's going to fly? Does it just pass the sniff test? Part of why I love doing the paper airplane shows is that I, I wanted to be a teacher. And I love being in front of a crowd and lighting them up with some new information. So the paper airplane thing is kind of a way to do that for me. So it's the best of both worlds. I don't have to do the boring stuff that I don't want to teach. I get to teach stuff that I'm really motivated to teach. So uh, you know, in a perfect world, I would teach people science day in and day out with, with these guys. This guy has wing droop. The wings are drooped as they leave the body of the plane. So if I throw it in a bank turn, it doesn't have that riding moment. And because the center of gravity is a little bit behind the center of lift, it'll just climb its way back to me. So it'll circle left or right. And if I throw it straight, it'll do a loop. If you look at the right flyer model that's out there, you'll see that the wings droop also. The paper airplane guy encompasses a whole lot. Uh, there's the website, of course. Um, there's a pay version of the website. You can learn how to fold stuff for free. There's the iPhone app. Um, which there's a free version and then you can, there's an a la carte version. Um, so, and then there are books, a uh, couple of books that I've written. Uh, and what I really love doing is traveling a little bit uh, to places like you know, Hiller Aviation here or to Singapore or to Chicago or Portland or uh, any number of places that I get to go to and show paper airplanes, show what they can do and explain, you know, really explain the physics behind it. So the first Singapore gig came about because I had posted a video on YouTube, just a one minute. I figured if I could just keep it down to one minute, you know, short attention span theater, uh, do one minute of paper airplane stuff, the coolest stuff all in one minute, uh, maybe that'll attract some attention. And to date, uh, that little YouTube effort has gotten uh, about a quarter million, it's 270 something thousand hits. And I get jobs from that little YouTube video. So that's my agent, YouTube. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I did a job for Google that was just purely entertainment. Uh, I did a job for uh, Quintiles, which was you know, a booth activity just to attract people to their booth. Uh, I'm gonna do, um, I guess this will air late enough for me to say this, it's kind of top secret. Uh, Genentech has hired me to do an IT uh, event for them. Uh, Intuit hired me to do um, an event for their artists, the, all their graphic design and artist people, just as sort of a conversation starter. So it really runs the gamut from uh, interesting sort of uh, odd floor show to, you know, here's how you learn aerodynamics. And the folks in Singapore have a national uh, flight competition that encompasses from elementary school all the way through postgraduate stuff. So they do everything from paper airplanes to uh, video controlled drones. And so they have me come over and show their kids how to do uh, paper airplanes, the basic aerodynamics. How do you get a plane to do what you want? And I can explain that with, you know, something really basic uh, that anybody can fold and put together and adjust. And so that's, you know, they love having me come as part of their competition every year. A couple of years ago, a few years ago, I got interested in breaking the Guinness Book of World Records because I noticed if your book said Guinness Book of World Records holder on it, you could sell a few more books. So, not a bad idea to be the record holder, right? So, I found out who had the record. Ken Blackburn had the record at the time. It's about 28 seconds. Um, I bought Ken's book, folded the plane. Not a bad plane, you know, but I had planes with that good a glide ratio. So, I figured, man, I'm in the hunt. I can do this. So uh, I looked at Ken's YouTube video. And when you watch Ken Blackburn throw a plane, you understand why he has the record. His right arm is basically a bazooka. My right arm, basically more like wet spaghetti. 
So I knew I was never going to be able to throw anything as hard as Ken Blackburn as long as I lived. So I had to come up with a different approach for the time aloft problem. This was my solution for the time aloft problem. So, armed with this little baby, I went to the Exploratorium. I kept this in the air for about 30 minutes. Sent that videotape to the Guinness Book of World Records people, and they said, that is one of the most amazing things we've ever seen. That's really innovative. That's, I can't believe that. We're going to have to rewrite the rule book to forbid your kind of plane. <laughs> so that's what they did. Uh, the first couple times I went after the Guinness Book of World Records for uh, distance, I really uh, tore my shoulder off. I was, uh, 30 something at that time and so that's not a kind age to start throwing hard. Uh, so I went through a lot of Advil and uh, made a pretty good attempt at the Exploratorium and believe it or not the ceiling is too low at the Exploratorium to break the record because I had one throw that really hit the rafters very hard. Might have been close. Uh, we'll never know. Um, so yeah that just the regular shoulder stuff and so you know I'm <laughs> I'm not as young as I was, and I, I never could throw really hard enough to do it. So uh, I got a ringer now. Well, I'm shooting for, and I wouldn't have to do it this way, it's just the way I want to do it. Uh, I want to do an all folded plane that you don't have to measure uh, any, any of the folds to accomplish the plane. Now, the guy who, the American held the record for years, Ken Blackburn, his plane required some measurement on the initial folding. And I was never all that knocked out with that. I was never sure whether I was getting Ken's plane right, you know, for his time aloft guy. And, and uh, the new record holder, Toda, this Japanese guy, his design is so elegant, so easy to fold. There's a little bit of a kind of a right about there fold in like the third or fourth fold, but it's not that tough to figure out. So I'm looking for, looking for a design that fits with everything else, you know, strong enough. Uh, light enough for time aloft and you know, heavy enough for distance. So, the two different sets of dictates for you know those categories. So paper choice, everything's critical. Paper choice is critical, the throw is critical. This is a 100 GSM A4, and this is where we were yesterday. It was kind of a clean look on the bottom of the fuselage. And as a request by my thrower, we're going to a notched bottom on the fuselage so that he can get his finger hooked in here, right inside there, and get a good throw. All of his power comes from that last moment where he snaps his index finger out there. So hopefully this will be a plane that he can have good success with. And he was at mm, 145, 150 feet with the other one yesterday. And hopefully we'll get, we'll get it straightened out so he gets a, a better throw and a little better glide. This is really broad wings compared to everything else we're throwing for distance. Oh, are we in the water? Yeah, we're in the puddle. Well, 157, not bad. We had a water hazard. Yeah. Hey. But uh, 157 is respectable. Um, 170 is the best we've done with regular darts uh, with, uh, with the professional arm. And 157 with this new wider wing glider, uh, I'm pretty happy with. So that's a good practice day. Today was a great surprise. I mean, we're out at Moffett, and I thought I'd made a small improvement, which ended up being a big improvement to that plane. I mean, it, for me, 157 feet is a big, big throw. Uh, 120 feet had been a good throw before that. So, you know, that little thing that I did to that plane ended up being a big thing. So one of the interesting things about, about being the paper airplane guy uh, is that's a fairly recent moniker that I've added to, to what I do. And uh, my boss was going, well, what? If, if Oprah was going to have you on, what would you call yourself? How would, how would you be introduced? And I, and I said, they'd probably call me the paper airplane guy. You know, and we, today is the paper airplane guy. And uh, constantly I'd show up at places like Hiller and the, the security guy would get on the walkie talkie and go, hey, the paper airplane guy's here. So that seemed like the natural thing to do, uh, is just to say, well, officially, okay, then I'm the paper airplane guy. The Maker Fair, which is, it, they just embrace all kinds of technology, all kinds of making of all kinds of things. And it's, amazing that people will still come to the paper airplane guy's booth. It still mesmerizes them. It's just a folded piece of paper and maybe it's because it's so accessible. You don't have to have batteries, you don't have to have, you know, it's just a piece of paper you could do stuff with. There's something about that. Uh, it, it's such an organic way to sort of pursue science. 
it's, it's all built into there. The whole scientific method's built into this guy. Uh, you, you've got, you know, you make a guess about how something might work. That's the hypothesis, right? You change a little thing, design an experiment, change a little thing on the plane, you know, that's your experimental design. You do a test, you throw it. Uh, it, does, it does or doesn't do what you thought. You know, so you get results, and analysis, and you start all over again. So there's the whole, the whole scientific method is built into there, and somehow I, people just sort of feel that about paper airplanes. Yeah, it's got this renegade edge to it, but there's also some science built in there somehow. It is a flying machine. You come to a place like Hiller Aviation and people will bring their kids to watch you do a plane and then um, you'll fold the plane and the parents will just, you know, on a lark, uh, follow along. And uh, when you get down to how to adjust the plane, how to make it fly, the parents are just right there. They're serious about it. They've invested 10 whole minutes in this thing. And uh, the coolest part is the parents will, will tell me afterwards, it is the first time I made a good paper airplane. And really, they've been able to make a good paper airplane all this time. They just didn't know how to adjust it. So I guess the hidden part of this whole art form is um, turning it into a flying machine from just a folded piece of paper. And so it's, it's getting, it's that really subtle transition, what to pay attention to, how to sort of mold that into a real viable flying machine. Because, you, you know, there are lots of designs out there. You can get the weight in about the right place, get the wings in about the right shape. And then, you know, what, what do you do? What do you have to know to take it to the next step? Well, the very first thing is uh, symmetry really matters. You know, neatness and folding. One side of the plane should be a mirror of the other. But more important than that, the biggest mistake people make is not paying attention to the tail feathers. This is the last place the air leaves the plane. So little tiny things wrong here make big, a big difference. The air gets deflected a tiny bit there and you're only pushing 2.2 grams around. So it doesn't take much pushing to get 2.2 grams to move a lot. So this trailing edge, the most sensitive part of the plane, and even adults will crumple that up or, you know, bend it the wrong way or... So keep that part pristine and you're, you're about 75% of the way to getting it to fly right. I think people are sort of struck by uh, a, a grown person sort of still hanging on to something that uh, it seems to be so frivolous. And then they're always taken by how much I've managed to wring out of this. You know, all the planes that do these amazing things. How many people pay, pay to get on a plane and fly somewhere to make paper airplanes? I mean, <laughs> when you think about that, that's just insane. My carbon footprint has been blown. <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's been an amazing run. If it never goes any further, then it's gone right now. It's been an amazing run. I see the keys to John Cullen's success as, first, by combining his love of origami with teaching, he invented a new business, paper airplane demonstrations. Next, he spent the time and money to craft a viral video that entertained and advertised. And lastly, by pursuing a world record, it allows him to tell an exciting story and improve his craft. Today's guests illustrate that if you have world-class skills, determination, and a bit of luck, you can create a successful business doing pretty much anything. I hope that this episode has given you many good ideas for increasing your business with passion.